warmly to my CFA level 2 preparation lecture. This is lecture 1 and covers corporate finance. The lecture would be self-contained in the sense that I'm not assuming any prior knowledge. So if you are a law scholar or a legal student, or if you are an engineer um, or um, a business student, in any of these cases, you can follow the lectures without having actually a level one for CFA. Let's get this started. The topics that I cover are capital budgeting, capital structure, dividends, and share repurchases in lecture one. Capital budgeting. Um, another name for capital budgeting, perhaps in German, is investment. Um, because this is where we look at how corporations invest. Um, the words capital budgeting um, indicates that uh, corporations budget their capital expenditures. Let's start with examples um, and get ourselves to uh, CFA mock exams, which are the best way to prepare for CFA. And this is an applied uh, rather than theoretical financial um, methodology. Um, and we would uh, like to be able to um, answer CFA mock exam questions. And I would have some at the end of this lecture for you. Our first objective, uh, learning objective, is to calculate the yearly cash flows. I notice that some of these words are in red because those are the words that we are going to emphasize. So this word cash flow means something to us. If money comes into our wallet, it's positive cash flow. If it goes out of our wallet, it's negative cash flow. And of course, the same thing applies to the treasury of a corporation. And what stays in the treasury is net cash flow. We are going to uh, look at these cash flows for an expansion capital project. An existing corporation um, taking on uh, a new project, adding a factory and a replacement capital project. We are getting rid of an existing asset, like a machine, and replacing it with another asset. And this word capital means that the project is long-term and, of course, requires capital expenditure. Um, our capital would be tied in this project. We, we want to evaluate um, these projects um, and see how the choice of depreciation method affects these cash flows. Um, and of course, that would bring in our depreciation um, lectures from our accounting courses. Here is the first example with an expansion capital project. Um, let's say that there is a new equipment that would cost us $450 million. And we are depreciating a straight line to zero over three years. Um, if we take on this project, um, our working capital would increase by $25 million. And finally, um, and the project can be sold even though it's depreciated to zero. Um, we would have a salvage value. We can sell the project for 50 million. Um, and this is after three years, the life of the project. We also have to pay 2 million to a consultant uh, for a detailed market share and cost analysis to be used for this capital budgeting decision. We also have some additional data. Uh, the revenue from this project would be $400 million each year. 
there would be annual cash operating expenses. Um, I mean, every year we would have cost of goods sold and selling general and administrative cost of 200 million. To review from your accounting class, this cost of goods so sold is our variable cost. If we sell five items, we have five times this cost. And selling um, general and administrative is our fixed cost, overhead, insurance, building, etc. So this would be total cost, um, both variable and fixed cost of $200 million per year, each year for this project for three years. Cost of capital in this case is 20% back weighted average cost of capital for example uh, we could borrow money and have cost of debt and we could have um, partners owners that give give us owners capital or equity capital um, and these two capitals would have different costs so the weighted average of these costs are 20 percent back is something that we would review separately we have a marginal tax rate of 40%. This word marginal is important and needs a definition. That means the tax rate that would apply to our corporation if we have another dollar of additional revenue. If we make one dollar more. This is not our average tax rate. Interest cost is $1 million dollars a year interest is deductible and allows us to reduce our tax bill therefore we want to look at it separately the problem says calculate net present value and IRR and make an investment decisions these are our two major tools for making investment decisions in finance net present value methodology and internal rate of return Step one of our calculations is to calculate the initial outlay for this project. How much money do we put out? Well, our initial outlay is $450 million, which is initial cost of purchasing these assets and um, doing this project, um, investing in it. Um, and we have to uh, increase our working capital by $25 million. So adding these two costs together, we get $475 million as our initial outlay. Then we are going to operate and run this project. So we calculate our operating cash flow for each one of these three years that we are going to run this project. Depreciation is a straight line and the value of the asset is 450. So we divide that by three for three years and we get $150 million of depreciation allowance each year. And this, of course, reduces our tax bill. So our cash flow is $400 million minus. 200 million dollars the 400 million dollar is the revenue from the project and the 200 million is our yearly cost and on this um, we have to pay taxes um, taxes are 40 percent um, so we want to calculate after tax a nice formula to remember in finance and accounting is one minus tax rate here, 1 minus 0 0.4 gives us our after-tax um, income, what we keep after we pay taxes. So 40% of this revenue goes to government as taxes, and 1 minus 0 0.4, or 60% of it, remains with us. So we multiply this cash flow by 0 0.6. Plus, we um, take the tax rate 0 0.4, and multiply it by 150. 
This is because depreciation is a tax shield. Let's think of it as a funny way. A soldier holds a shield in front and government comes with a sword to take a piece of us and this shield protects us. So uh, this colorful word depreciation tax shield means that if you are allowed to depreciate, you reduce your income by this amount, by 150 million each year because depreciation is considered a cost. And this 150 million is a non-cash cost, a cost that you don't pay, a cost, a money that is in your treasury, but you get to deduct it and you pay less taxes on this amount. So 150 times 0.4, your tax rate is a tax saving that you receive because you're allowed a depreciation deduction. Therefore, you and I can think of depreciation as a tax shield or a tax subsidy. Government gives us uh, lower taxes by allowing us to depreciate. And in fact, in times of recessions and bad economic times, government may give us more generous depreciation. Instead of a straight line depreciation, we may be allowed to use accelerated depreciation and quickly depreciate this asset. Therefore, we save early on on a lot of taxes and that's money that wouldn't go out of our treasury. So here, 40% of this 150 does not go out of our treasury. Okay, so our cash flow for uh, from this project for a year is 120 plus 60, 60 from depreciation tax shield, and 120 could be thought of as um, a net income or after-tax profit. So it's 180. Finally, this project ends. When a project ends, we calculate a terminal cash flow. Um, and um, um, terminal um, um, year after tax non-operating cash flow, which we can write it abbreviated as TNOCF, um, terminal operating cash flow, is this 50 that we get at the end because of salvage value of the asset. Even though we have depreciated to zero, it's worth 50 million. Plus, um, we have to uh, recapture some of our working um, capital, uh, forgive me, uh, I should say, we have to recapture all of our working capital. We are not running the project anymore. So this 25 um, is our money and we can take on our working capital. And working capital is really something that is um, used for uh, this current assets or short-term assets that we have to run the operations, things like inventory and cash, um, etc. Uh, we don't need those anymore when we don't run the project. So the 25 million would be in our pocket. Finally, we have to pay more taxes because we depreciated the asset to zero, but the asset has the value of 50. So this uh, market value of the asset 50 minus zero, um, it's depreciated to zero gives us a 50 uh, recaptured depreciation and at 40% tax, we have to pay another 20 million tax when this project is terminated. So at the termination time, we ha would have 50 plus 25 minus 20 million taxes or 55 million um, as uh, our TNOCF. couple of things that are very important about this project and also in capital budgeting. One is this idea of sunk cost. Often in life, um, we have uh, spent money or time and effort on something um, and uh, then we are thinking, should we do this thing or not? 
the time and money has been spent on investigating and getting information about it. Let's say the information comes very negative and we shouldn't do the project. Uh, then uh, we should not say, oh, we have sunk a lot of money into this project uh, and we got to therefore undertake it. To make a longer story short, sunk cost is forever gone and it should not be considered as an additional cost of the project and be considered together with its profit. Um, the other um, issue is the extra interest that you pay on debt. Yes, interest um, saves us on taxes, uh, but this interest should not be considered as another cost. Because when we calculate the weighted average cost of capital, it already has the cost of debt and cost of equity and averages this. So in other words, uh, when we pay back, we pay the cost of debt. We shouldn't calculate interest or cost of debt separately. That would be uh, double counting. All right, let's put all this information in a typical table that we use in finance. We write down all the years, uh, either on a timeline or in a table, an Excel sheet. Time zero is always today. Today our expenditure is $475 and negative cash flow that goes out of our treasury. After a year, we make 180 positive cash flow from this project. After two years, we make another 180. And finally, at the end of the project, we make $235 million. Some of these monies are in the future, so we want to calculate their present value. We have to pay cost of capital of 20%, so monies that we generate in the future has to be discounted at a rate of 20%. At time zero, uh, an expenditure of $475, is worth $475. Of course, the units are in value. At time one, um, an income of 180 uh, should be discounted for one year or divided by 1.2. Um, and we would get 150. In other words, if we have 150 and we make 20% on it, uh, multiply that by 1 to get your 150 and multiply it by 0.2 to make 20% on it and you get 180. So 180 a year from now is worth 150 today. Similarly in year 2, 180 is discounted back 2 years, 180 divided by 1.2 twice or 180 divided by 1.2 squared gives us 125. Finally, a cash flow of 235 three years from now is worth only 135 today. 235 divided by 1.2 raised to uh, power of 3 or cubed. Um, now all our monies are at time zero. Um, present value at time zero, so we can add these numbers. Minus 475 plus 150 plus 125 plus 136 gives us minus 64. That's the idea of net present value. Make all the cost of the cash flows and um, positive and negative cash flows, make them all into uh, a present value and then um, subtract the negative ones from positive cash flows and you get net of this uh, cash flows at the present time or net present value. Um, and that's minus $64. The present value um, or net present value rule is if um, this net present value is positive, it adds to the corporate wealth or our wealth. 
and if it's negative it subtracts from it or if it's zero it adds nothing so the rule is if the net present value is positive you take on the project then we get to internal rate of return irr internal rate of return is something that you need a financial calculator to calculate it calculating it by hand is not easy especially if we have many years essentially the question is what interest rate would make uh, 475 million of cost equal to 180 million a year from now 180 million two year from now and 235 million three years from now in other words 475 equals 180 divided by 1 plus IRR plus 180 divided by 1 plus IRR squared plus 235 divided by 1 plus IRR cubed. And then we got to solve this equation for IRR. Um, if we don't have a computer or a calculator, uh, the only way to do this is by trial and error, putting different interest rates in that equation um, and calculating an interest rate that makes the two sides equal. But with financial calculator, uh, which is something that you should make yourself familiar with, you should purchase one. Uh, I use HP for these lectures. Um, and you should also read the financial calculator requirements of CFA. Um, an interest rate of 11.6% uh, makes the net present value of this investment zero or 475 million of investment would give us um, a present value um, of uh, this future cash flows of 180 and 180 and 235 um, of also 475 so we get a net present value of zero of course the rule for internal rate of return is to compare this 11.6 with the cost of capital which is 20 percent um, and um, a nice statement is um, hey we are paying 20 percent for capital but this project generates 11.6 percent that is less than cost of capital so don't do the project if the project made us more than 20 percent then we undertake the project so both net present value uh, positive rule and internal rate of return greater than cost of capital rule tell us that this is not a good project and we should not invest in it it would destroy our wealth um, and make less money than cost of capital for us um, here are um, uh, calculator entries um, for hp 12c uh, one of the two calculators that is allowed uh, in cfa um, i won't do a lot of this uh, in these lectures calculators are something that um, you should practice with and be very quick um, because CFA exam um, depends on the speed of answering the questions. You would have one and a half minutes per question, um, and uh, a calculator is very helpful. Um, also, in our quizzes and in our mock exams, you would get exactly one and a half minute per question. Okay, we um, Mm, have the information ri written here how to enter it in the calculator um, I don't go over it um, I leave it in this slide and this is something that you should practice on your own and of course it's fair to ask me questions about it. and here is comments about calculators let us uh, briefly review internal rate of return um, and the reason for this review again is that I promised you that these lectures would be 
self-contained um, show um, with a level of maturity that comes from studying other classes um, but without relying on any of your finance or business classes you can follow these lectures here is a definition in words IRR is the discount rate that makes present value of inflows equal to the present value of their cost. In other words, internal rate of return is a, an interest rate and discount rate that makes net present value equal to zero. If you are into formulas, one side of the equation is zero and the other side of the equation is adding up cash flows over time and discounting them at the rate of IRR. Cash flow at time zero is divided by one plus IRR raised to power zero that becomes one, so it's not discounted at all. Cash flow at time two is divided by one plus IRR squared. Cash flow at time 10 is divided by a 1 plus IRR raised to power 10. So we bring this cash flow 10 years back. And of course, we do this until our last cash flow, and you saw this in our classroom it's an exercise that we did earlier. Let's look at a classical example uh, from um, Braley and Myers' uh, textbook. Um, it says, um, well, the old book was Brilliant Myers, and uh, now there are additional authors. Uh, it says, please draw net present value profile of the following two firms. The first firm is uh, firm L, and uh, it has a cash flow of 100 million negative. After a year, it produces 10 million after two years, 60 million, and after three years, 80 million. The second firm is firm S. It has the same initial outlay of capital of 100 million, and it generates 70 million after a year, 50 million after two years, and 20 million after three years. So let's do the net present value of these two firms or two projects. Well, to calculate this net present value, we need to know cost of capital. Let's just start with cost of capital equals zero. That's quite easy. Um, it simply amounts to adding these numbers up. Minus 100 plus 10 plus 60, plus 80. And that gives us $50. Now let's put cost of capital equal 5. Minus 100, plus 10 divided by 1.05, plus 60 divided by 1.05 squared, plus 80 divided by 1.05 cubed. And that gives us $33. You could continue this with cost of capital of 10, 15, and 20%. For 20%, I have done the calculation, and I would get minus 4. 10 and 15 is left as exercise for you, and of course, net present value of project S um, is left as exercise for you to fill out. Um, and feel free to ask questions about it if it gives you any trouble. This can also be used much quicker, uh, calculated much quicker if you use your calculator. Here I have the keys to push for HP 12C. Please practice with those um, and the nice thing about the calculator is that it keeps the information in 
So all you have to do is change the um, cost of capital um, um, and quickly get an answer. It saves you time if you have only one and a half minute to calculate. All right, after calculating all these numbers, uh, we get net present value for project L and net present value for project S. They are in second and third column of this table and various cost of capital K is in the first column. Now we are going to plot this data. In this plot, on the horizontal axis, I have the discount rate. And on the vertical axis, I have net present value of the project. And I have five red points for uh, project S and five blue points for project L. If you connect these points together, you get two curves. Uh, these curves um, talk to us, tell us what um the net present value of the project would be for every given uh, cost of capital uh, we call them net present value profile of the projects when these curves hit the horizontal axis you get the internal rate of return so that's another way of calculating internal rate of return by hand and of course it is tedious using the calculator is much better for project l it hits um, at 18.1 uh, it hits 0, 0.0 right here and that's 18.1 percent cost of capital and uh, project s hits here which is 23.6 percent cost of uh, capital. So those are respectful, uh, um, respectable, uh, resp uh, respective, sorry, um, cost of capital for these pro two projects, internal returns. There is also a point that we call cr crossover point. That's where these two curves hit each other. And that point happens here at 8.7% interest. We have a formula for calculating that point, and that point is useful for uh, lectures that we would have later on. All right, we had a quick review of uh, uh, internal rate of return and its calculation. Let's also move to other uh, issues that we had in this lecture and make them more concrete. First, let's focus on capital budgeting decisions and have a definition. These are decisions based on future yearly periodical cash flows um, that are not based on net income or profit. We are looking at cash flow, money that comes in and money that goes out of the corporation. And this word cash flow is uh, a nice word. Think of a river of money coming into the treasury and going out of the treasury. Um, profit is different. A good example is, let's say you don't have lunch money and you get 10 euro from your uh, friend. Um, this is a positive cash flow and of course this is not profit. This is not money that you worked and earned. Um, so cash flow is different from profit. One important point was that the sunk costs do not matter. For example, if you paid for that consulting fee to analyze if this project is a good project or not, uh, we should ignore that cost in calculation of other costs of uh, project or negative cash flows. The other issue that we haven't talked about are uh, things that in finance and economics we call externalities. These externalities matter. A good example of externalities 
is cannibalization. We make a new product and customers buy this new product and don't buy our old product. There is a reduction in sales of our old product. We are cannibalizing, eating up our own uh, sales. Uh, this should be calculated as a cost. Uh, when we have a project that eats up revenue from other projects, we have to consider this um, cannibalization effect. Uh, if future cash flows are reduced because of this new project, uh, for some other projects uh, or for our subsidiaries, uh, we have to calculate this as an additional cost for the new project. Finally, an issue that we have seen, debt financing costs don't matter and they shouldn't be considered a cost because uh, and, uh, cost of debt capital is already in weight the average cost of capital or in VAC. Do not subtract cost of debt or interest payments. Ignore the $1 million in our example. Each one of these issues often come up in CFA exams as something that would give you trouble in calculating. Um, so practice uh, observing these issues and of course in practice of finance and capital budgeting, these issues are quite important. Next, let us focus on incremental project cash flows. Uh, we calculated cash flows in three stages. There were three different types of them. First one was initial investment outlay. A good example was purchasing a factory. This is often a large negative cash flow. The second type of cash flows were recurring and we had quite a few of them for the life of the project. Um, and these are called operating cash flows, OCFs. Finally, when the project ends, uh, when the machine goes kaput, uh, kaput works, uh, it's a German word that works in English too, um, and usually in English it means the machine makes a big noise and uh, breaks, uh, but that's our funny way of thinking of the end of the life of the project. That's the terminal year. At that year, we um, perhaps sell some of these machineries, um, some of the factory items, uh, and have some salvage. Um, um, we can salvage the um, cost of this machine. Uh, so we have a non-operating cash flow, TNOCF, terminal operating cash flow, or terminal non-operating cash flow would be a better uh, word for this abbreviation. Let's look at this as formulas. Our initial investment outlay is usually two items. Um, we have investment um, of capital, fixed capital investment. We purchase machinery and factories. And we have an increase in um, our networking capital. Um, and we want to uh, understand this increase in networking capital carefully. It, it, is, uh, it comes from deducting two items. Those two items are changes in non-cash current assets and changes in non-debt current liabilities. The best way to understand this is to go back to your accounting course and look at, uh, let me do this quickly, uh, look at a balance sheet. Here is a typical balance sheet and I have three items as current assets, cash, accounts receivable, and inventories. Cash is not considered, so you are looking at accounts receivable these are products that you have sold and um, customers owe you money, but they haven't paid it yet. And inventories, finished goods or raw materials that you have purchased. So these two accounts are added. Going back to this 
formula here is non-cash current assets and of course that change means how much extra non-cash current assets would we have that's why we need two years and accounts receivable had gone from 351,200 to 632,160 we subtract 632,160 um, from 351 uh, which subtract 351 200 from 632 160 and the difference is an increase in accounts receivable we also have inventories increasing from 715,000 and some to 1,287,000 and some um, so we look at the difference and that would be uh, what we have in this formula change in non cash so cash doesn't count but the other two items in current assets count and now we are doing the same thing with current liabilities but debt doesn't count change in non-debt current liabilities go down here to the other side of the balance sheet where you have liabilities and equities of a company accounts payable has gone from 145,600 to 524,160 had increased this increase counts this delta counts notes payable which are short-term uh, borrowing um, is debt we said non-debt so this one doesn't count and then we get to accruals and accruals have gone from 136 to 489 accruals are things like wages that workers have earned and other um, costs that accrue uh, short term and haven't been paid yet. Okay, so we know how to calculate net working capital investment. It's changes in non-cash current assets minus changes in non-debt current liabilities. Let me go over a comment here. Fixed capital investment outlay or FC investment includes cost of purchasing the fixed asset, how much we pay for the machine, but then this machine has to be installed. Um, so installation, delivery, and other related costs that go into having this uh, machine set up and performing on our factory floor all count as this uh, initial investment um, finally we should look at book value of land and any other asset that we may own and use in this project often um, in investments uh, we make this mistake of not counting um, the cost of items that we have we also do this with our own labor if you work at a business, you are losing uh, the opportunity cost of working somewhere else. So as an owner, you got to calculate a wage for yourself, a fair wage. Uh, here, if we uh, have the land uh, and then build the factory on it, we have to calculate the cost of land even though we don't pay for it. Um, Let's uh, pause and look at um, a question here. And that question is, why is cash not included in networking um, current investment? Um, this has to do with an underlying assumption that this cash is not working for us. If we had a uh, foreign exchange business at the airport and they had 100,000 euros sitting there and we were selling those for dollars, uh, then this cash is part of our inventory and it's working for us. And we have to um, account um, this 100,000 euros as um, extra working capital that we would have. So the assumption is that we are a manufacturing firm and we have 100,000 booked in the cash account. However, the funds are invested in treasuries or in commercial paper 
and their earning interest for us. That is, this current asset earns a return and is not a part of our working capital that we must pay a cost of capital to employ in our business. And of course, I had the counter example that if we are in foreign exchange business, uh, then our cash is really an inventory and it's not uh, invested uh, in um, treasuries or commercial paper or something else and making us a return. Back to a formula that we use. Cash flow if is our sales, which is the first item that appears um, in an income statement. Uh, minus cash operating expenses minus depreciation. So we're sort of going down this income statement. Um, then we are paying um, taxes on this. So we multiply it by one minus tax rate to see what do we keep after taxes. And then we add depreciation because depreciation is a non cash cost and for calculation of cash flow it should be added in um, but it's subtracted for profit calculation and saves us on taxes so um, this same formula can be uh, reworked and written as cash flow equals s minus c uh, after taxes times one minus t plus t times depreciation so either formula can be used and these are two formulas that uh, you should know by heart and utilize in uh, corporate finance. Um, finally, let's uh, focus on this terminal year after tax non operating cash flow, TN, uh, operating cash flow or OCF. Um, TN OCF is the salvage value um, which is a pre-tax cash proceeds from sale of a fixed capital how much we get it as a market value um, and um, this amount we also add it to what we recover from our networking cash flow of this investment and these two cash flows um, are captured at the end but we have to pay extra taxes um, for um, this uh, uh, salvage value, um, extra uh, money that we made um, uh, over the depreciation. And so this, uh, this sale amount is subtracted from the book value of the asset. And if it's a positive amount is left, uh, then we pay taxes on it. And of course, if it's a negative, amount uh, we save on taxes 